Hey friends, today I am with Dr. Allison, not Kevin today, but Dr. Allison, and we are talking all about my trip here in the Dominican Republic. We're really going deep on the sun in part one of this episode, because I really want you guys to understand why the sun actually may not be your foe. Stay tuned. Hello, hello, friends. Coming to you from the Dominican Republic. I'm still down here on my little healing journey experiment. I figured I would uh, do a show from here, even though I've really not done anything else. Um, I would do a show from here just to kind of share what I've been doing and how it's going. Kevin is not with us for this chat show, but I did bring in our very dear friend, Dr. Allison Monette, who has been on the show before, is my naturopath. And I brought her in because there's going to be things I'm going to be talking about that I've done that I don't really have all the knowledge around. So Dr. Allison will help explain a little bit more of the whys and so forth. So I was like, okay, we'll have a little chat, a little girl talk about healing at the equator. And in the meantime... I hope you have enjoyed the episodes in the last two weeks, especially Dr. Jack Cruz, who you know is uh, somebody that we both follow and um, have benefited from his years of research um, and is, uh, is, is really kind of shining a light on what we need to do more of, what we need to open our eyes to. And in our heal event this month with Riz, who did a lot of uh, readings for our inner heal squad, I got a lot of good feedback from everybody. And they were like, you prepped us properly for him. <laughs> and, uh, and we're really, really interested in the things that he had to say. And we're a little upset with the system that we've been dealing with. And so, um, I'm really glad that the message is resonating because it is a little scary. It's not what we're taught. It's not what we're used to. We're taught to be scared of the sun. We're taught to wear a lot of sunscreen and he's telling us to do the complete opposite as is Dr. Allison. When I met her, it'll be two years in June. Dr. A welcome to the show. Hi, Maria. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, when I met you, you know, almost two years ago. And you said, all right, this is going to be like probably a two year journey. And I was like, I gulped, but at the same time, I was like, okay, I, whatever I have to do. And one of the things you said is you have to get in the sunlight at sunrise. And so I'll backtrack and explain why I'm here. And then we can talk about some of the things and the whys in the house. So when Dr. Cruz and I sat down as I started listing the things I've had to deal with health-wise thus far. He just looked at me and he was like, every time you open your mouth, you're making a bigger case for the fact that you need to get to the equator. And he's like, the problem is with a lot of you, especially women, you'll say a million reasons why you can't. I've got a baby, I've got this. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. I will do whatever it takes. I will go. I don't think he believed me. <laughs> I don't but, think he did either. I... <laughs> but here I am. And so I, I looked at my calendar that was in November and I knew the holidays were not the right time. Obviously it's my first holidays with my little one, but I knew January I was going to set aside the time. And so here I am and it's been probably two and a half weeks or by the time I leave, it'll be two and a half weeks and change. I leave for a wedding and then I pop back so I can do a full month. But one of the things, and, and I've been doing a list of things every single day. I've been keeping a journal, by the way, because I do look at this like an experiment for all of us without putting a lot of pressure on myself. Um, I've been keeping a journal of all the things I've been doing and eating. And so the number one thing that I'm doing. And the reason why I'm here is for this sun. So Dr. Allison, will you explain why getting the sunrise and the sunset is vital to our health? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, 
I, I would say this. It's I, I'm glad that you prepped it with the thought of, okay, this has been like two years in the making, right? This mm-hmm. is not that you just popped into the Dominican and started giving yourself some sun. You've been doing sunrise for now over a year and a half, really readying your body, you know, for this moment, right? But the really amazing- Pia, are you proud of my tan? I was going to say very <laughs> nice tan melanin creation right there, which is great. I know you said too, this is like the most tan you've been as an adult, right? Ever. Kevin, when I met Kevin, he was like, no more sun. And so I blame Kevin. I'm kidding. But he was like, <laughs> you're not tanning anymore. No more sun. And so I credit him with being or looking as young as I do for this long, but I also probably got really sick because of it. My parents were in the sun all the time. And I think that there was a period where my mom stopped going in the sun and that's probably why she got sick. Um, along with some other things, but, um, oop, sorry guys. I actually forgot to put my phone on airplane mode so that nobody calls, forgive me. Um, I think that, um, for me, I used to tan with baby oil. I mean, back in the day, we were outside all the time. And then somewhere around 22, when we moved to LA, Kevin was like, no more sun. And then I didn't. I I mean, sometimes I would let my body get sun, but never my neck and my face. So now to be out there and I'm getting like so dark and I was getting nervous because I was getting so dark so fast. I'm like, wait, what's going to happen after two and a half weeks of this? <laughs> well, I do remember back when we first started working together, I remember there were those few moments where you thought, okay, am I, you know, brown spots, all the, all the things that you're trained to think about are bad, right? From the sun. However, I would also say like, look at your dad. He looks really good. If he's gotten a lot of sun in his life, which we know he has, like he, it's actually helping him in a lot of ways too. Right. But yeah. So, so I would say this, like, think about the sunrise as the most critical moment for your skin, as well as your eyes to prep for the day. Now, of course, nature's got a design that we've been built to work with. So that makes sense that when the sun rises, we're turning everything on to prepare for that midday higher powered UV light. But it starts at that moment of sunrise. And the reason why is because if you know the physics of light, which I know, you know, Dr. Cruz mentioned more about, but the cool part about the physics of light is that when it's sunrise, the way the light has to travel through the atmosphere really creates this balance of the red and the blue. And there is a tiny bit of UVA. I have I have this like really sensitive UVA meter that proves when the sun is rising at your location, that little bit starts to emerge. And it's that recipe, that light that's going into your eyes, but is also on your skin, which you want to think about as a solar panel, that turns on all of your body's daytime pathways, also prepping your skin to handle the UV light. I know it's not what we're taught. It's not what I was taught in medical school. It's what no one is taught in medical school. But why would we have photoreceptors that take in UVA light, UVB light, if we weren't meant to get that exposure, right? Now, that's also important to think about that all of the most high-powered UVA, UVB combined doesn't happen until midday. So wouldn't it make sense that the entire morning was prepping your body to handle that midday sunlight? And Dr. Cruz, I mean, he's got great information and he talks about it as like hybrid tanning, Um, He calls it the solar callus building. I mean, these are not medical terms, but they are ways to really think about 
how do you get your skin prepared to actually take in the light to get the health benefits, which many people know, you know, UV, um, UVB is vitamin D, it's super important, but only a small part of the story, right? Like there's the UVA, which is palm C processing and melanin and really all the other amazing benefits of the sun. But what's been shown is that if you get that morning sunlight spectrum and then experience that high level of red at that time, which is also at sunset, but as you're allowing your body to get that slow emergence of the UVA and then the UVB, that morning red light actually pre-treats your skin to produce more melanin, which is your body's natural sunblock. And when you do it right, so starting with that morning only and then little bits of the midday, which is exactly what you did two summers ago. You know, you started, mm -hmm. I remember it. I remember telling you to do this. And I remember you actually telling me you were doing it. And I tell patients this all the time, probably nine out of 10, it takes them very like much longer than I would hope they, it would take them to get to do it, but you were all in, you were all in, you were trying to find the spot in your yard to get the sun. Like you knew that it was important. And when you do it that way, I can tell you, I have patients come back all the time and say, I didn't believe you, but I don't burn like I used to burn. In fact, maybe you won't burn at all, depending on your skin type, you know? So I think you might've talked about this with Dr. Cruz too. And, you know, he's a Fitzpatrick one, you know, a very burnable skin, but he's proven that building his solar callus and getting the light right, he's super tolerant to the sunlight now. I know you and, and even myself, I have a, a little higher Fitzpatrick, so I don't tend to burn very easily. Although I've had a little bit of slight burn, it takes a lot for my skin to actually burn. However, since I learned this myself, I have tried to see if that will happen. And it, it's virtually impossible. I actually traveled to the 13th latitude last July. So that I went to El Salvador in July. Then the Salvadorans there couldn't believe that myself and my family could spend the entire day outside and not get burned to the point where they actually mentioned it to us. They said, we've never seen Americans come down here in the middle of July getting UV. I mean, it was 14, 15. It was super high and we did not burn. Now, of course, we have skin that we've prepped for a very long time to be able to do that. But we really did it as an experiment, just like you're doing in the Dominican. Mm -hmm. I think you're 19th latitude there. I think so. I think it's 19 or I know it's like there's a little bit of a span. But, you know, once you get into the tropics, you know, you're getting into that more high powered quantum yield, you know, the quantum yield of your environment is how much is available to you, which is an interesting point because I, I, I know you know this, and it's one of the reasons why you needed to go somewhere else, because we do know LA, although you're getting sun and your latitude is better than Connecticut, there are so many reasons why the quantum yield there is muted because of other non-native EMF frequencies. So you might think you're getting sun there, but you're really not getting high powered sun. So for you, I know that was, and I don't think Jack believed you, but you had already been thinking this through. So, mm -hmm. or, you know, it was, it, he didn't know that, but it was just more proof of I need to go lower latitude to a place where there's a really good quantum yield. I you've built your skin to be able to handle it. And it is kind of the test, right? That you were able to go down there. I know you've been spending, 
you know, party the entire day out there. Exactly. What Sunrise I to sunset. Like, yeah, I, I yeah. do follow what he said, where he said, like, the lions know when to go in the shade. Exactly. There have yeah. been moments when I'm like, okay, it's too much. I got to yeah. go inside for a little bit. Yeah. But really, like, I've been soaking up as much as I can. Now, there have been some cloudy days, there have been some rainy days, but sunrise to sunset out in the bikini. Right. And that's really how you have to do it, where you know, think about this, like what do most people do when they maybe do a beach day? You know, they, you get ready, you drive to the beach, you go to the beach for when it's really nice and sunny and warm, which is midday. You missed out on all of that pre-treatment of the skin and your eyes. So your body doesn't know how to handle it. So you get red, you may burn, you might get blisters. And so we have had this interpretation that the sun is bad, but you know, Jack's J Dr. Cruz has got plenty of references to prove that sunburns do not confer to skin cancer. And I mean, he's shown pictures of himself, you know, he 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 definitely has all the science there there to to prove that. Now, do we want to have burned skin and blisters? Obviously not. That's uncomfortable, but Unfortunately, we've not been taught how to use our skin right, which is why I love that you're sharing this topic because most people haven't heard this. And I mean, mm -hmm. I can work with patients one on one, but it's only a few people at a time, you know, like we're really it's nice to have a conversation about hey, have you ever tried this? And, you know, and I think I might've shared this with you because sometimes I like to just share personal stories that my husband used to fry, like a like a French fry. I mean, he only burned before I met him. I mean, to the point where I am so glad I learned what I learned because I just knew that didn't make sense. And we look back at pictures and I'm like, why are you so, like, you're like white as a ghost. Like, how is that possible? <laughs> and it probably took, you know, like two straight years and summers of like really getting the skin right. But, you know, even he's proof of all day long, he had really burnable skin before, but his solar callus is working properly, you know? So it is not a quick thing as you know, but it is something that once you get your skin working, now you're just getting the benefits of the sun so far beyond just the vitamin D, even just the melanin. I mean, the circadian setting and all the other fabulous things are just the magic. So I want to get into so many things right now, like the <laughs> actual health benefits, but then I also want, I want people to understand, um, also with sunburns, like it was funny. I told Dr. Cruz, I go, we pay to go to the dermatologist office for them to burn our skin and we give them a lot of money to do it. And yet we're scared of our skin burning, but whatever, that's a whole side thing. But when you're talking about building your solar callus, you are going out at sunrise. So your phone will tell you when sunrise is. So if it says sunrise, like here, it's at 7, 17 AM, I'm outside before 7, 17 and I'm waiting and I'm looking at the sky, whether it's cloudy, rainy, or sunny. I mean, if it's raining, I'm undercover and I'm getting that sun and you want to get as much of it as you can, but you've said up to at least 12 minutes on as much of your body as possible. So there's these things called Kaniki bathing suits where they're see-through because your special areas need those light, that light too. Now I'm not wearing it here because I'm a little paranoid, um, but in Connecticut and at home, I wear my Kaniki so that my special areas can get the light. So I want people to really understand because I've had to ask a zillion questions. And when you're doing something new like this, that everyone's going to have a thousand questions. So you're outside rain or shine, you know, cloudy or whatever. You're going to get at least 12 minutes. I'm doing two hours here every day. And, um, and then I go inside and I meditate and then I've been playing pickleball after. Um, but, Bye. but, um, but you want to get that. And then you're getting as much of the sun throughout the day as you can. But as you're building your solar callus, you have to be careful with that. Right. So 
Yes and no. I mean, Dr. Cruz will say there's not really anything you need to be careful with if you're getting all of that morning sunlight exposure. It really depends on your personal health experiment. The more unwell you are, the more time you need. So, I mean, I have patients with really critical health issues and I will tell them spend two, three, four hours in that morning sunlight, you know, then take a break. And you know, if it's especially in Connecticut where I am, if it's during the summer, it's possible. That's that's what you experienced the, a couple of summers ago. Mm-hmm. And if you if your health is not well, the more time the better. You know, then when you're feeling that, like that sense of, okay, I need a break, then you can take a break. But if you're using the sun throughout that morning spectrum change, that is what nature really built us to get. And there is that intuition, like you kind of, you just know when you need a break, you know, and, and when you're well, then honestly, you can get by with less and that's the design of, you know, seasons. I mean, how, how did humans live in new England for so long? It may not be optimal health compared to the equator, but in a lot of ways we used the seasonality, the cold, the change in the light, the eating seasonally, and we really can still thrive because the whole sun exposure allows us to adapt to the seasons, to the different utilization of our mitochondria when it's December versus when it's it's June. So it's about being safe around it. You know, I always say the word like safe sun exposure, not because I believe it's unsafe in any way. I just believe that because of our modern lifestyles, we don't know how to use it correctly. So we've interpreted it as being unsafe, but really Mm. it's just that we don't know how to use the sun because we're, we've domesticated ourselves, right? We've taken ourselves out of nature. If we just woke up and we were outside, what would you do? You would do your day out. Right. I'm doing everything outside. The only thing I'm not doing is this right now because people are here and I know they're going to want to say hello and, and and I might get interrupted. Yeah. So you're doing sunrise and you're doing it for other reasons too, because it's, you're setting your internal clock, your circadian rhythm. So is that why sunset is important or is there light at sunset? That's super important for the solar callus. Yeah, no, it's really about setting that circadian clock and then shifting your body into that nighttime repair phase. So again, when you're on a wellness journey, a lot of times, depending on your health, it's critical to get both parts right, because there really is a light and dark cycle that if you just forgot everything else, that is mission critical, that your body needs to know light versus dark to run everything, you know, down to how do your skin cells know it's noontime? How how do they know to prep for that higher powered sunlight? It's because you've gotten the light in the morning, right? And the light at night, right? By getting darkness. And that sets your circadian tone, your circadian rhythm, which allows your cells to know time of day. So I'm not just getting sunset. So I'm watching the sunset, but then I also make sure now I'm really getting crazy about not having any lights on as much as I can. So I'm really trying to just shut it down. I have dinner before sunset and then, um, trying to shut down all the lights. And I've noticed like the other day we did a heel event And I was not feeling okay because I had to have lights so people could see me, but I'm also making sure I go outside and gaze at the moon and at the stars so that my body is like, okay, for sure. It's nighttime. I get it. And now I'm going to bed. Um, so, so making sure your body knows light and dark, what happens in the body when it's getting this quality sun, not through glasses. You can't wear your glasses outside. 
no glasses, no contacts, by the way, because your eyes have UV receptors that are taking in that sun. So you can't wear those. But what is going on inside our bodies? And I know Dr. Cruz said like 70 to 80% of Neolithic diseases could be cured just from getting proper sun. So can you explain a little bit of what is the risk reward here, right? So anybody who's listening to this is terrified of the idea of no sunscreen. Um, and their doctors are going to scream at them and I'm going to get probably slaughtered. But, um, but the truth is there are so many health benefits and, and any of the things we're afraid of, like sunspots and stuff like that, will cover that too, because I was scared of those as well. And we'll tell you what happened after. Yeah. And, and yes, also to mention the sunglasses too, you know, basically anything that's between the sun and your eyes will filter that full spectrum light message. So I would think of it as this, you know, the fact that we live indoors and out of sunlight, we actually have this perception that we're getting sun, but everything's filtered indoors. And then any of our lighting alters that spectrum further. And now pretty much we're all living under blue light. You know, we are really in blue lit environments most of the year, most of the day. And I would actually tell you, I worry much more about being inside than I ever worry about being outside. When we look at disease and that link back to circadian function, which helps our mitochondria run as they should, and those are the two pieces that affect all chronic disease. And I I believe, and you might have linked it with, with Douglas Wallace, you know, some of this research is out there and it's been out there for decades that we know if your body's clock is running well and it's speaking to your mitochondria, that all health can be run correctly. And it's really when those two things start to break down, that disease starts knocking at the door. So being inside is way riskier than being outside. I was was talking with your team. I I was planning on being outside. That's why I was trying to do it at this time. But it's like dreary and rainy. And I do not have the ability. I don't have a covered spot with Ethernet connection to, to do it. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, I'm inside. So I'm inside. Where are my blue bloggers? And it's it's not as good as being outside, but you know, really we have to think about why are we so comfortable and confident that being inside is not riskier for our health, right? But then when you are getting the light into your eyes, the one thing to think about is that our eyes we sense as our camera, but really our eyes are setting our circadian clock. And that is maybe a more magical part of the eye story than even being able to see, which is also pretty cool, right? But if we look at the physiology, I mean, we have this track called the retinal hypothalamic track. It's basically a straight track that goes into the hypothalamus, which is where that circadian clock lives. So it's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, SCN, Um, it's all very established in the circadian biology literature, but we have this design that allows the light to go straight in through the pupil directly into the hypothalamus and it sets that clock. So we have photoreceptors that take in this light message and the eyes allow all of that interpretation to take place, which is also a really great design because if you're thinking about this and you're not in the Dominican, like me in Connecticut right now, although I will say I have many a times when I was building my solar callus, gone outside in the cold, in my Kaniki, in the middle of the winter to build my solar callus. I don't do that as much now because it is running really strongly, but if you are higher latitude and it's winter, you still have that ability to sh- to really have a purposeful setting of the clock, even with just your eyes exposed. So if you have to work- That's what I was going to ask. Like, yeah. what do you do when it's cold? Like, for example, 
I know when it was cold in Connecticut in the mornings or cold in LA. And by the way, in the mornings, it does get cold. I had, um, a robe wrapped around my shoulders and my back. So my front was getting it, but I was feeling like I was comforted a little. Right. Sometimes you have to be a little creative. I have had patients build these boxes that like prevent (laughs) the wind. And I mean, there are some really cool creative things out there. I also wish maybe someone, maybe a young person will grab hold of this information and create some things for, for everyone to function a little bit better. Um, you're right. You know, it's easiest to start this practice when it's not the dead of the winter. And a lot of times when I work with patients, they know this is not a quick fix. So we'll work with where they're at, trying to get them to the point of being able to tolerate as much as possible. But that's what I always say, as much skin as you can expose, but always your eyes take out the contacts that that can be the trickiest thing to get patients to to start doing because I know it's something that obviously allows them to see the world much easier, but contacts filter the light and you cannot get the right message in glasses are nice because you can take them off. Sunglasses are even worse because they filter all the UV and the red, and they kind of don't filter the blue. So it might actually make things worse. And that's a whole nother rabbit hole, but there's definitely no tie to uh, sunglasses in medicine. It's actually kind of more tied to Hollywood. If you look at all of the Hmm. old details of most of the sunglass companies, which uh, interestingly, like one of the biggest ones is in the town next to me, which like my grandmother worked at, and they were the ones that paid some of those Hollywood people to advertise like their aviators. It's, it's the AO, AO yeah. is, I mean, it's, it's a wild story where you think even where did sunscreen come from? I mean, that's another rabbit hole that, that Dr. Cruz has all documented in some, some, even of his, his old post that it's not really it was never scientifically based. It had a lot to do with, you know, money. Obviously, this industry is is a very, um, they make a lot of money in this industry, right? So it's yeah. a hard thing to, to take down. But if you filter any of those solar panels, your eyes and your skin, it's a different message. And this is what we know. If that's altered, your brain through your eyes, through your skin interprets that different message. And what we know very strongly is a high blue message without the UV, which this is a good point. Think about in nature, we have blue light. Blue light is not bad. We we need blue light from the sun, but blue light would never exist outside without the red light to balance it, which is the part that always protects us from any of that free radical damage from the blue light. But it would also exist with the UVA light and the UVB light if we were in the middle of the summer. So there's something to that combination that our body has learned to interpret. But if you take out the blue spectrum and you don't have the balance of the others, we know the brain interprets that as a stress message. And that's a big part of the story that I know Dr. Cruz talked about as well, that we're running on blue light and our body senses that as stress. I can tell you, I see it in every patient who's living a modern blue light microwave kind of life where you know, we have all of these frequencies. We're only running on blue light. We have, it's called the PVN. I We call it PVN stress. The body tones to stress. That stress becomes chronic. And it's really what you see everywhere. You know, the anxiety, the mood, the, the those parts of the story are all a light story as well. Wow. So sunspots. That was a big thing I was afraid of. And the first thing any woman will say to me, like, I can't, I, I, I just need a little laser to get rid of the sunspots. 
So whether it's the white spots, the sunspots, tell us the true origin of those spots. And I'll tell you, everyone in my house has noticed my skin actually get better in the sun. So my sunspots went away for the most part. Um, my skin is a completely different story. I would have never believed it, but I was so desperate for my health. I'm like, bring on the spots. I don't care. Like whatever. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I cared, but I couldn't care. Right. And so share with everybody a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I know it's, it's a tough thing. Obviously we, you know, we see our, our surfaces, right? We don't want to have our surfaces not look well or, or match to how we feel internally. And um, I know we talked about this and, and I encourage like, just keep going and know that if you can get your skin made right. And so this is how you have to think about it. The, the skin that you have coating your body is a coat, just like animals in nature, the coat changes depending on the season and the kind of light that you experience. Now, this is really important because that is the palm C processing with UVA light that determines the type of cholesterol that you're producing, essentially the kind of skin that you are manufacturing to take in that light frequency. So we actually make different skin in the summer than we do in the winter. And that's actually interpreted by that light message into the eye, which is very cool when you think about that makes sense, right? How does our body know that it's going to need to handle more of that UV light? It knows it's summer. It changes the kind of cholesterol that goes into our skin and actually can handle that higher UV. It changes the, the fatty acid profile that goes into that skin and that's what our modern living is not allowing our body to do. So if the light that you're getting is not balanced with the UVA and the UVB and the red light from being outside, the blue light causes you to develop skin that's actually prone toward pigment. So we know blue light actually is what drives brown pigmentation of the skin and that, again, that's actually all on Jack Cruz's site. So that information is there, but it's really counterintuitive because we try to do so much to our skin, right? Makeup and sunscreens and all the things that we put onto our skin alter the light that our skin is receiving. And we actually don't build skin that can take the light in right to make the correct pigmentation. Ooh. I know. Yeah. Mind blowing. I Actually, think about the makeup. Yeah. Th this is one thing to think about because I, I see it a lot in patients. They'll come in and initially they'll say, wow, I, I can see like white spots in my arms or on my legs. Like as their skin is transitioning, it will actually sometimes change what you see. Maybe initially you're going to see more browning. You, you're going to see change because you're skin coat is changing. And makeup is probably the trickiest thing um, because we're so used to wearing it. I, I can tell you, I have, it took me a little while, even myself, it's just like one of those comfortable things. Like you're used to wearing some makeup and I always use like a, a natural, like very little makeup. But as soon as I really started to understand this, you know, now years ago, I stopped wearing makeup and it was the hardest thing to transition to. It kind of feels weird, right? That you don't have it on. But when you do not have that filtration, the makeup filters the light too. It's doing the same thing the sunscreen is doing, maybe almost worse because there's pigment in there. So once you think about that makeup between you and the sun, what light spectrum is your skin actually getting? So we know some of, you know, the biggest concerns like melasma and brown spots. If you really dive into the science, it's predominantly driven by layering things on your skin, whether it's sunscreen or makeup that alters that light spectrum that actually creates the blue 
higher frequencies and that leads to more browning. And I can tell you, cause I have a few patients that are male patients that, you know, there's right. There's male makeup, probably, probably more common in Hollywood than it is. Mm -hmm. in Connecticut. But I only see melasma or that darkening of skin pigment in, in men that are like male makeup wearers. And that's a, that's a sign, right? You look for like the canaries in the coal mine. Yeah. And I can see it in my patients that aren't makeup wearers or haven't historically been like heavy makeup wearers that their, their skin generally looks better. Now, again, this is not, you know, this is not a massive experiment that I've done, but the more I've looked for it, the more that I've noticed that those who tend to be like really heavy makeup wearers because maybe they're covering something up, then they never get the, the sun. And they maybe it's good when you go out at night and you're going to be inside and you're going to be under artificial lights to wear makeup to block that. <laughs> well, actually that has come up and, and Dr. Cruz has very much like squashed that all together. He's more like, you should never do anything that makes you stay up too late at night. Well, Just, of course. Yeah. yeah but if you're going color. to, like, if you're going to go somewhere, you're going to be under artificial light. Isn't that maybe hypothetically kind of smart to not expose your skin totally to that blue light? Right. I, I will say that I, I've thought about it. I've even tried to figure out, you know, what could make sense. I will tell you, there's definitely some brands out there that are marketing. I think they're lies. There's no blue light protection makeup that makes any sense from a physics perspective, at least not that I've seen. Maybe there is. I, I do feel like these are things we have to be smart about. I just out. got off a call with someone and I'm working on a couple different products. And I said, can we come up with a blue light product? And it's so funny that you say that. Cause I'm like, I mean, we're going to have to really perfect. This, this is going to have to be really good, but. Right. My worry always is, you know, when you're putting something on your skin, it's, it's not just on your skin, you know, it's, it's, there is some absorption there. And then does that alter longer term what the skin is able to receive? Like even, even lotions and oils and all your face products. I mean, I, I've been on a little experiment for the last six months using no skincare products to alter that light spectrum. And I would actually tell you, I believe my skin is better from not using all of those, even though they were really good products, you have to think about you're putting them on your skin. It's changing the light frequency the skin is getting. And so, so really are you're not using a face moisturizer even? I, so I actually, and, and, I, I followed Dr. Cruz for a very long time and I'm, you know, I'm a, a healthcare member and he does these monthly powwows. And it was sometime last summer that one of the members had come on and, and asked him this question. And like, it was a really long conversation about, Hey, even if you're using a, 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 a nighttime cream or whatever, that still alters light spectrum. And I kind of had the moment of like, oh, I'm using something like, I mean, I was using a really good brand and a great product and they're from Vermont and all great ingredients. But how I was like, how do I know what light spectrum my skin cells are getting once I'm putting that on there? And is that changing your skin coat, right? It's like, if you wear a jacket, your skin's not getting the same message. So it's a personal experiment. I wonder, these are the things I wonder. And he's very adamant about do not put anything onto your skin when you're trying to use it properly. <laughs> because, My light's going out. Yeah, if you're changing, <laughs> right, right. If you're changing that light spectrum, you just don't know what your body's getting. And obviously nature is designed as it is. So I've been trying to do nothing to see if that makes a difference for my body's all my cells timing. Interesting. So I really like not using anything. Um, in fact, I ran out of stuff here. So I just been using coconut oil. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, so, so when my skin's dry, I just use a little of that. And even with Athena, you know, people just put lots of diaper cream on people, a diaper, or whatever. And I'm like, only if there's a problem, I'm not putting anything on her unless there's a problem. Right. And the other thing I always think about is like, okay, if you're feeling that there's some dryness for, for various reasons, 
if you're going to put on anything on your skin, do it at night, you know, because you're going to be sleeping, right? You're not going to be under light. It's not going to be something that could alter that light spectrum. So coconut oil or like tallow, there's a lot of really great tallow products, but if you do feel like you need moisture, I would do it at night because at least then it's probably the least amount of altering. And then, you know, if you were doing a heel, like a heel journey, like you trying to have all of that daytime, just be your skin. Mm-hmm. Get the light. It's really the best thing that you can do for your health. Well, and also if your skin is dry, it's an indication you're not hydrated. So you well, really should just yeah. focus on hydrating your body rather right. than just, you know, fixing the symptoms. So I'll tell you down here, I'm having a coconut every day. I drink the water yeah. and then I yeah. eat the coconut. So I'm super hydrated and it's only like, you know, once in a blue moon, if I feel like my, usually my shins have a little dry spot or like it feels a little scaly from the sun. So I put a little coconut oil on there, but I've been makeup free the whole time, which has been a whole experience in and of itself experience because, um, I'm used to wearing makeup and I'm used to always being on and I've gotten the most unbelievable feedback, not wearing Good. makeup, funny enough Good. from like people who are really aesthetic people. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Okay. But I'm doing it because I want to be as clean as I can. And I also want to be able to create a new pattern that I can go home with and feel okay. Just being me and that I am enough the way I am. And I don't need to put on a show for everybody all the time and look like a certain thing all the time, because that is, it was funny. Kevin was having a session with our hypnotherapist and she said, Maria puts such an extreme amount of pressure on herself. And it wasn't until a couple of days ago, it was cloudy sunrise. I'm outside. I'm in my bikini and I've got my palms and my feet in the sand. And I'm trying to, you know, make sure my spike glands on hands and feet are getting that, you know, negative electron charge from the ground as I'm waiting for sun to come up. And I'm like, God, please, can you just, I really need this full healing to take place while I'm here. And, and then I'm negotiating and I'm like, okay, well, okay. Maybe not head to toe. Like maybe like, at least I need to see like improvements in my liver and, and, you know, I need to see that good. And then it started hitting me. Oh my God, exactly what she said. I put so much pressure on myself. I was like, I need to be able to show people that this works <laughs> and all of that. And I'm like, wait, why do I need to show anybody anything? Who said that I am supposed to be this, this you know example all the time? Like, why can't this just be that I took some time to experience myself and to focus on my health and to try to get better and whatever comes of it comes of it. And so it was a big moment, but, um, but you know, we put so much pressure on ourselves and whether it's having to look a certain way or whatever, and it's been really freeing and something I'm definitely going to carry over when I get back home. But, you know, maybe that that is such a good thing, right? That you've been doing it this way for how long? And I think this was really about that reconnection, like, to yourself. And, and I, I mean, and I think I shared with you, like, I love that post that you had. It's like, if you're not good enough for yourself, who are you good for? And, and mm-hmm. here you are really paving the way to be better for you to, so you can be better for your family, but also for all the people that follow you. I mean, it's freeing to not have to stress about every detail, right? That you're, you're just being you so you can connect yeah. with nature. And yeah. Like I didn't have to do anything to get ready for this. Normally I'd have to go do my makeup, whatever. I'm like, right. okay, my hair is sweaty from pickleball and I have no makeup on and yeah, I know. I mean, you're, yes, your, your team was like, Oh, you, you look camera ready. I'm like, I have no makeup. I have, uh, this is it. Like it's, this is, this, this is, this is me. Yeah. But that's a good thing, right? That yeah. you can just be you, but isn't that really, I feel like where we're at in the world is you, sh- everyone just needs to be themselves, but you can be that person when you're really running 
And it sounds so silly, but when you're run by nature, you can think good. You can feel good. You can Mm -hmm. be good enough for yourself. And I think that's what your kind of journey there has showed you that you can actually, when you're running on all the right frequencies, actually be stronger. So before we move on to some of the other things I'm doing, the last thing, and I know there's going to be a thousand other things about sun people are going to want to know about, and this isn't the last thing is, and this isn't, wasn't even an official episode. It was like, okay, we're going to have a chat about everything, but, (laughs) um, is melanoma and the fear of melanoma. Where does it come from? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, actually this is a really good one. And I, I, it's so funny you're asking me this question because I was listening to a really old Jack Cruz podcast this morning and there was gold on that podcast talking about this very topic, um, which is so interesting because a little bit of like the older Jack Cruz stuff is very calm and, and collected. It's, it's like a little different than than current Dr. Jack Cruz, who I I feel his like burn and desire to really share this information. But this old podcast was 2019, I believe. And, and I mean, he was sharing information that was from prior to that, but, you know, really the rise of melanoma and and some of the, the coolest data comes out of Sweden. And I mean, this is the reality check is that First of all, Dr. Cruz always says, why would melanoma track with low vitamin D levels if the sun were causing melanoma? I mean, right. Let's, let's just like, think about that. If you had a lot of sun exposure, your vitamin D levels should be very high. Now they are not always because having UVB exposure doesn't guarantee that that your skin can actually make vitamin D. This is really important because I have a lot of California patients who go out in the sun, but because they don't have good water production in their cells to actually do the step to convert cholesterol into vitamin D can't actually happen in the skin. And that's a whole nother topic. Which thank God I have been able to. Yes, exactly. You know, this is the experiment, right? That you can prove it. You're not taking it. As a supplement, you're you're looking at your endogenous ability to produce it. It's a really good proxy, but we know melanoma tracks with low vitamin D levels. It also tracks with high latitude. Sweden has such good tracking of health metrics for, for their nation. And they've tracked it for a long time. The rise in melanoma is scary in countries like Sweden, where again, it doesn't take much to think about it. This is not a country where they're getting a lot of sun exposure. And they the, the country even said that people wouldn't even take low latitude vacations in Sweden until more recently. And most of the melanoma, if you look at where it's located on the body, it's not in spots where sun exposure ever gets to. Now, this is where Dr. Jack Cruz's podcast that he did with Rick Rubin and Andrew Huberman, he actually released a lot of really cool science. And this does relate to this story that he has a lot of theory. He hasn't made up anything. He's pulled together a lot of information. And what we know about melanoma is that it really it's abnormal cells looking for light. And again, I would encourage to go listen to those podcasts because it explains it so much more, but essentially it's lack of having proper UV light controls to actually get the cells to divide properly under normal melanin production that keeps us from having melanoma. But melanoma does not track with vitamin D. It does not track with higher rates at low latitude. It's really 
a story I think that's been co-opted by medicine to keep us kind of afraid of the sun, but only because I don't think they've pieced it all together. You know, what Dr. Cruz has pieced together has not been followed by kind of the traditional medical world. And we know that when new science kind of gets pulled together, it takes a good 10, 15 years for medicine to catch up. He always says like, I can't wait for 15 years. I'm 60. Like I, that my, my He's like, career, I'm going to see it. Right, right, right. So I, and then the other thing is that, that we know like the highest rates of melanoma are actually ocular melanoma. So some of the newest melanoma that's developing is ocular melanoma. Enough, so yes, this is important because what light do most eyes see these days? Blue, Blue light. light. And that's, it's all there. He's laid out the story pretty elegantly. This is a huge concern. And again, why I would be more concerned to be indoors in a blue light lit environment 24 seven versus being outdoors. We don't have a rise in ocular melanoma because people are seeing the sun because we know people are very compliant about wearing their sunglasses, wearing their sunscreen, not getting midday sun. I mean, it's, I can tell you, I don't have patients that get sun right until I've convinced them to get sun right. Yeah. Very conscious. Like we've done such a good job, especially in America to say, beware of the sun. Don't go out in the sun, wear your sunglasses in the winter. I mean, like th this is wild. Wear your sunglasses in the morning. I mean, there's not even yeah. much light in the morning to worry about. Well, you know what? I, I never thought about, I stopped wearing sunscreen almost two years ago, but I never thought about the fact that I'm out midday and I'm like, okay, sun come through, but I've got makeup on. And yeah. so there were all these filters we're not thinking about, but I was just thinking of a friend who got melanoma, pretty pale skin guy, but he's always, I feel like in the sun and always on his boat, but perhaps I wonder if you're not getting that morning sun that's preparing you, perhaps yeah. that's where melanoma does become an issue. It a hundred percent. Again, wow. I've never heard almost, anybody talk about that though. Yeah, no, ja Dr. Cruz, it's there is a ton of it. Now, again, like I I have followed him since 2013. You know, like I I've been I I've printed and read every Jack Cruz article probably that's ever been out there. You should see my library. I like to print it so I don't have to read on my screen, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so, so I've been following, I, I did have a long, a bit of a hiatus, you know, I had my daughter in 2015 and life happened, but you know, there was a little gap between when I was actually really um, d diving in with drag crews, but kind of more since around 2018, heavily in 2019. And then since then I followed him, but he has, absolutely laid out the story of melanoma being driven by blue light and our bodies not having that circadian mitochondrial function to be able to do normal physiology. So when you look at melanoma, it's, it's really just that circadian mitochondrial dysfunction that's driving the cancer state because of lack of light, lack of internal light that would keep everything in check. And again, this is like way probably more detail than you wanted to talk about, but I know that you, that you listened to the Rick Rubin podcast and I know that he talked a little bit yeah. about it, but we have this ability within our body to make our own internal light. Fritz Pop really did a lot of that science long ago to prove that every cell emits light, it, biophotons, every cell within the human body emits light. And that light is what keeps all the cells in check. It keeps them dividing. It keeps them in a non-cancer state. When you are not, for many reasons, producing enough of that internal light. So if you're run on blue light, you're not likely producing enough light. You know, if you don't have enough water production at the mitochondrial level, you're not going to produce enough light. And when the body doesn't have enough internal light production because this internal light it's in the uv frequencies like that's the part of the story that jack really elucidated was that we have we have so many things in our body that are uv light absorbers 
how would that make sense if we didn't need UV light, right? So all yeah. of the most critical things are UVA absorbers. They, I mean, it's our UV of, of the whole spectrum. But if you're not producing enough light internally, those cells, the melanocytes have to travel looking for light. And that's where they go is to the surface. And then shit goes wrong. And it goes wrong. And it, wow. it's blue light, you know, so it doesn't have to be UV light. It's looking for light. The surface could have blue light, but if it's, and maybe you've seen this too, but a lot of, I have a lot of like male patients that will say, oh, I have like head, head melan, you know, melanoma on my head. Yeah. Well, that's where my friend got it. Where's, where's the blue light coming from when you're indoors? The light the ceiling. That you have on your head. I mean, it, yes, it's. Well, it, and they have less hair than us. So they probably. Right. It always always tracks with that. That was and my, then, my friend I was talking about. He had, he has very thin hair up here and he got it yep. on the top of his head. And you know, he's a, it, think about like people who have boats. I used to live in a wow. lake. People would only come out on the lake at noontime. Yeah. They would never go out in the middle of the day. We would be out sometimes all morning. We were the only people out on the lake all morning prepping our bodies. Like, oh, I'm the only one out here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Actually, you're going to need like garden workers. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> and they're seeing know, me make like the sphinx in the, in the thing facing the east. And they're yeah. like, this girl's whack. I mean, the, the bummer, the good thing is that I, I look, when I lived in the lake, it was, it was pretty private, but you, know, you could see all the houses. I would, every morning we would be out there and say, we see no one. I guess none of those people were my patients. Like we, we saw no one and it was amazing. But I also feel like how, how sad is that, that we're not connecting to this very simple thing that our biology needs to run on. It's such a simple tool, but if you're the, like your friend, I mean, did he probably do light wrong all of his life? Probably. Probably. Yeah. But I mean, if you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. So, okay. So that really, that's something new. And that was just like, you know, my head being like, well, this makes sense. Maybe right. if that, that would be why. Um, and it's funny, like I'll even say not being on devices. The only time I'm on a device is when I'm outside. Cause you said it's okay because right. you're getting full yeah. spectrum light. Right. Yeah. So, um, just being inside now, like I'm, my, I'm getting head pains, like, <laughs> like, oh, um, but the light at the equator, why is that light the best light for our health? Right. Yeah. So I think there's probably two reasons to really consider is that the closer you get to the equator, the more stable the light cycle is throughout the entire year. You know, so if you were at zero, you would have 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark all the time, which if you're thinking about circadian function, that's the easiest for the human body to adapt to, right? Because you're never having to allow it to shift. When you have 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark, it's really easy to get enough light when every day there's 12 hours of light. You know, when you yeah, go- like if you live in Finland and there's only three hours right. of light, yeah, you have so set- then- Yeah, because this is like the thing that people don't understand is like why the latitudes make a difference. Right. It's because exactly. of that, like you have less opportunity to get light and also it's freezing cold. But we will talk about why the cold actually produces light too, which is good. Right. Yeah. So, so the tricky thing is that even though, you know, Finland, they obviously have some of the year where there's a lot of light and some of the year where there's not a lot of light. Like if you actually added up all the light, Finland gets the same amount of light that the equator does. It's just there's more during the summer, less during the winter. And obviously when you have days that are 20 hours of sunlight, you can't get it all. So then that's the real problem is that unless you had nothing else to do, you're not getting 20 hours of sunlight to then buffer the lack of light in the winter. So yeah. that's, that's the real challenge of, of sort of la going higher latitude is that then you have to be really good about getting the light right 
to then be able to get by in the winter when there's less light. So that, that's But like if a- you do live higher latitude, like in Connecticut, for example, or whatever, the, the other thing you can do to counterbalance is getting cold. So even when you're yes. outside getting your sunrise and you're cold, you're actually doing yourself a favor because you're producing more UV light inside your body with that cold. And you can explain the science behind that better than me. Right. Yeah. I mean, the two things that really set your circadian rhythm are sunlight and temperature. So that's how we as humans were able to adapt to going higher latitude where there's less sun, but when there's less sun, there's more cold. Now, again, this requires you to actually get the cold, but this is where, you know, some of the, um, the older cold thermogenesis protocols that Dr. Cruz developed were so important that's really been co-opted by like the three minute, 33 degrees cold plunge story, which I would encourage people to go beyond because the cold is way more than a hormetic response. Like it's actually primordial. It's meant to be something that we run on getting any cold in the winter when you're higher latitude can help keep your circadian rhythm set. You need the cold. And there's some of that value of sunrise with the temperature allows your body to know that it's February 2nd you know, versus if it were the middle of the the summer, it would be a totally different spectrum, but also warmer temperature. So it is such a cool thing that you can, you can get by higher latitude as long as you're actually okay with getting cold exposure. And there's ways to use cold, especially if you're actually using like cold therapy, you know, the, the general sweet spot is that 50 to 55 degrees and actually, you know, plunging for enough time to get that cold on your surfaces. Again, this is sort of like the sun on your surface is as critical as the temperature on your surface to tell your body what to do at the right time. And that actually helps to increase endogenous UV light production, which is again, how our body is technically running. All the biochemical pathways are really driven by light. Um, and that's the light that our body's producing internally. So we, we can get by, you know, some people better than others, but if you don't use the temperature, if you're just living your 72 degrees all day long life in the winter in Connecticut, you're never going to get by in a healthy way. And when you go back to what you were talking about with melanoma, that those cells are searching for light, that explains why we get sick, I think. Yes. And you can explain this if, if yes. I don't explain it right, but just call my common sense brain is we're so indoors. We're so with blue light. I just think of my journey. The second I made it in the industry, I was in studios all the time under lots of artificial light. I got Hashimoto's and the brain tumor. Yeah. And then the list of things just kept coming and coming. Um, it's because the body's des- the cells are desperately looking for light that they kind of go off path and, and, and that's where disease comes. So when you're thinking about ditching the sunscreen and getting that light, think about those cells all getting what they need. So they stay where they're supposed to stay or go where they're supposed to go. Right. So, I mean, that's, that's exactly it because really when we think about DNA as being part of this whole story, really the story is that if your DNA is becoming overexpressed, over talked to, you know, essentially your body knows that it's not running as it should. So it's looking for a better solution. A lot of that lack of light control is what drives your mitochondrial DNA to talk to your genetic DNA. And that's where things start going wrong. But it's really just your body saying, hey, we're not doing the right thing here because we don't have the light right. And it doesn't know what to do. So it's always searching for a better solution. The problem is that if if it does that forever, things start going poorly. And, you know, I mean, I think, you, yeah, you mentioned like the Hashimoto's and I, I think when we first spoke, I was like, well, that's like a gateway disease. It's sort of telling you like, okay, autoimmunity is knocking at the door. That means your immune system is not getting its messages to work as it should. So it's 
trying to help you out technically, like in the long run, it's your body adapting to the suboptimal environment, trying to help you out in the short term while it's hoping you're going to get the light reloaded into the system. So it really is all about light. It really is all about light. And it probably is, you know, I think when we think about like all the things in science, it's one of those really mysterious things that, you know, we have just the the best and most brilliant scientists have studied it forever. And we still don't know everything about light, which is, hey, that that's the best part, right? It's like, there's no end to the possible learning, but we do know enough to know it is we the need it. part of the story. And the fact that medicine and science has kept it out of the story is probably like the biggest medical crime that we keep people on that biochemical level, that band-aid approach. Like you, you only know just enough about your health where you know you could do things to help you feel better. But if you really knew that this is how you should run your body to get it back to normal state, then you, I guess, technically, I would say you wouldn't need medicine if you actually just knew how to run your body. Yeah. Right. Well, that's medicine the problem is we don't. Yeah. I'd like right. to think that it wasn't nefarious. I'd like to <laughs> think that it started with uh, a theory and then it snowballed into, oh, now we can't take it back. <laughs> but right. But I mean, I know, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it all kind of went the wrong way back in the early 1900s with the Flexner report. And we did know a lot about light. I mean, Finson got a Nobel Prize in 1905. I mean, we knew so much about light and it kind of got abandoned for, you know, for, for tech medicine. And, and, and not to say that, there, you know, there, there's an absolute place for all of it. It's just, it should only be the place when there's no other option. If if we really could take a step back and, and go back to the, what we did know in terms of, you know, it's like you said, everything's about light. I mean, let's face it, everything is about light. I mean, well, everything- look, like the way I explain it to friends is photosynthesis can't happen. A plant can't grow without the right. sun. Okay, friends, we're going to leave that right there because in part two of my chat with Dr. Allison, we are going to talk all about the Dominican Republic, what I've been doing here, why I've been doing certain things, how it's been working out because I actually have some results to share and so much more. So tune in next Monday for the continuation of this conversation. I hope you guys are enjoying it. I hope you're happy and healthy wherever you are in this beautiful world. In the meantime, be nice people, make good choices, and be present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.